So I'm going to introduce the Eco Hydrology Project, and you know that was the short title, uh, and really that term Eco Hydrology reflects that marriage of hydrologic processes and ecological processes on the landscape. Here's the longer title, and it's a slightly modified one: The Early Effects of Variable Intensity Mountain Pine Beetle Attack, Red Green Attack on um, Hydrology and, and Vegetation Dynamics. I'll revisit this title uh, here shortly, near the end of my little introduction. But basically, really, this project started <coughs> shortly after the mountain pine beetle found its way into Alberta, and there was a lot of, of questions and concern about how mountain pine beetle might affect some of our critical watersheds, particularly off the east slopes. And really, these diagrams, these cartoons, are just meant to sort of illustrate that, that a lot of what happens in terms of governing the hydrology of these landscapes depends on the interaction of climate and some of those processes with the vegetation. So the vegetation really drives that. And to be able to understand what's happening at the catchment scale, we really need to focus our attention on that stand scale. Because this is the way in which mountain pine beetle exerts impact on the landscape. So really, the catchment scale response is the cumulative inertia of, of these processes operating over time. And this is tied into some big questions that we have, some management questions. How big? How big is the impact uh, likely to be after we, we see mountain pine beetle attack in these forests? And moreover, how long are those effects going to last? So a bunch of questions around what's the trajectory of recovery? And we can have potentially lots of different trajectories depending on what happens. But basically, these are, under, these are unknown kind of uh, um, questions about how mountain pine beetle is likely to behave and, and influence hydrologic behavior. What British Columbia had to do when, in terms of answering this question, is their hydrologists and their modelers, they used their knowledge of how harvest affects uh, these features, how other kinds of disturbance affects these features, and there are important differences between uh, harvesting or those disturbances and what's likely to happen after mountain pine beetle. And that really is important in terms of, of, of what's likely to happen. So really, we're, where are, why is this a unique sort of feature on the landscape? Um, first, the overstory is selectively killed. And needles are retained on those trees for a period of two, four, three, or five years, whatever. Um, and that sets it apart from disturbances like harvesting or severe wildfire. Moreover, the understory and the soil is not directly impacted by a mountain pine beetle attack. And that really sets this kind of a disturbance aside uh, from, from harvesting a wildfire. And as a consequence, there's a bunch of processes that are occurring uh, at that forest floor and that understory vegetation layer that are different, we think slower, than what we might see after some of those disturbances. And this really, when we back away from it, uh, sets up a couple of, of important points. We think about how lodgepole pine in, in Alberta and Western Canada, very well adapted to a disturbance regime of wildfire. And while we certainly have had small endemic outbreaks of mountain pine beetle in, in the past, you know, there's questions as to how well is the species from 100,000 feet adapted to these kinds of disturbances. When we think about what we know about the ecology and autoecology of the species, some of these things don't immediately present um, simple pictures of how this species is likely to respond. Uh, in particular, our neighbors to the west have had, had some interesting experiences with mountain pine beetle, and there are important differences between what they've seen and what, what we see. Um, we have a overstory that's killed, lights not penetrating, um, there are conditions in the understory. Well, in Alberta, we have a much drier microclimate. So lots of questions about what kind of microsites do we have for regeneration? What are the conditions in the understory in terms of some of those initial dynamics? When we compare things to British Columbia, arguably, British Columbia has a much larger footprint of mixed conifer than we might in our large pole pine zone. We got an awful lot of pure pine might be other species in the understory, but we have a large area of pure lodgepole pine. So, real questions about how those mixed conifer stands in terms of the, the other conifers being able to project themselves and be involved in the recovery of those landscapes in the absence of those other species 
You know, what are we likely to see? And then these big questions around this business of needles not falling off initially. So there's no immediate change, large change, in the light regime, in the microclimate. Um, so this begs a lot of questions around what kind of microsites do we have, what kind of, what kind of environmental features and ecological <coughs> dynamics are going on in the forest floor, because this sets up that initial trajectory of vegetation responses. So a very long way of basically uh, trying to, to argue to you that these issues around scale and scope of impact and longevity of those impacts are very tightly coupled with these, these questions of what's happening to the overstory, what's happening to the understory. Uh, so therein lies the broad research questions that our project um, intended to tackle. Really, how is the hydrology likely to be affected? Uh, focus on that water cycling within the stand, so stand water balance, and what, are, what in fact are some of the early changes we see in the, uh, in the understory vegetation, both trees and other vegetation forest floor communities. And, and McIntosh is taking, really leading that one, and Pablo Pina is spearheading the work on the, uh, the, um, the water balance work. And Ellen and I are... We don't do any. We're not entirely <laughs> sure what our role is in this. <laughs> we steer. We steer sometimes. <laughs> Yeah, so our approach from the get-go was um, looking at, at other research that had, done, had been done in British Columbia. One of the big issues they had is they set up study sites looking at uh, mountain pine beetle affected stands. One of their challenges was, what do you compare it to? They had reference stands that were unaffected by mountain pine beetle that they had selected, but very shortly after they started, those reference stands disappeared because the mountain pine beetle had spread so rapidly. So trying to learn from their experience. We said, okay, we're not going to wait for the beetle to do this for us. We're going to try to simulate or emulate the canopy scale effects of mountain pine beetle by applying herbicide to emulate those effects. Kill the trees um, and hopefully those needles stay up there and it kind of emulates what mountain pine beetle does. And so our approach from the get-go was, okay, let's look at a couple of different types of treatments. Let's look at a couple of different levels of mountain pine beetle attack. Uh, where, where, we attack, where we kill everything, 100% attack, and then let's, let's simulate something a little lighter, so a 50% attack. And really, we had lots of discussions about how we do this, and we ended up going, all right, let's kill every other tree, salt and pepper kind of a, uh, approach. We need some untreated reference stands, and then we thought we would look at some harvested areas to sort of compare those in the context of what might be done with a salvage harvest. So those really were the three treatments or four treatments that we try to try to simulate to study what's going on with mountain pine beetle. We selected stands in um, in the area south of, of Hinton near near the town of Rob. Uh, uh, so this is our study site in here and then really this is a, a large extensive single polygon. This is a single stand of a uh, very old mature pine, 120 years old, kind of a medium site index uh, about 23 to 25 meters high. Lots of discussion about well, what kind of stand should we look at. And we decided to really focus on kind of the modal pure pine stand that's representative of maybe the center of mass for what we have in, uh, in pine stand types in the province. Uh, so within this area, we established four treatment plots here. And these are large treatment plots. These are 2.2 hectares in size. Um, to which we would apply each of those, those treatments. And what we would do is we would study some of these features, some of these processes for a full year before we applied the treatments, and then study them for two additional years. So that was really the focus of this water balance study. So effectively, we're studying both the treatments and the controls during the before treatment period here. And then we apply the treatments, and then we continue to study those same processes during the post-treatment period. We have two years post-treatment. So that really was, was the overall experimental design here. But with the vegetation understory work, we really needed to have some replication of these sites to get a, a broader uh, sense of the response of these systems. So at the same time, we set up additional groups, two additional groups of these same treatments. Uh, these are smaller, 1.2 hectares each. So again, all four treatments are, 
are um, reflected there. So this vegetation study is taking more of an analysis of variance or a replicated kind of uh, uh, approach at this. And so this really was our study design. We set up the instrumentation, we do uh, measurements for a pretreatment year, and then we follow the response of these systems for two years after the treatment. In, in thinking about how we do these herbicide applications, we consulted with a lot of expertise here in the province. Um, Milo ended up being our, our, our sort of main uh, source of expertise, and we, we thought about girdling, we thought about hack and squirt, and a bunch of other kinds of approaches. But on Milo's advice, we settled in on using these easy jet lances. They, they basically inject a, a 22 cartridge, here shown in the bark of a tree, that's got glyphosate in it. So we inject it into the bark, and that glyphosate just slowly leaks into the cambium and slowly kills the tree. And, and we apply various or numbers of, of these cartridges to trees based on how big they are. Um, we didn't know how this would work. Nobody has ever done this, to our knowledge. Uh, so people have tried. This age of on this, this age of trade, exactly. So we have lots of experience with chemical thinning in juvenile stands, but nobody had tried to kill uh, large mature trees. So this was all a bit of an unknown. And then West Fraser uh, Hinton Division uh, worked with us very closely and certainly did a lot of work for us in producing some of these harvest treatments. So these are basically applied here uh, sort of mid-summer of 2009 at the end of our post-treatment uh, measurement year. What did that look like? Um, so here's a, here's a snapshot of what it looked like. About a year after we applied this herbicide, and I should mention, we did not apply herbicide to, say, our 50% treatment. We did not apply herbicide to every other tree. Because of, of experience with flashback, basically you've got untreated trees that then suffer some effect of the herbicide. We anticipated some of that, and based on recommendations, we ended up treating between 30 to 40 percent of, of the trees. And so this is what they look like a year after. You can see they started, we got the, the initial kind of green attack, to some initial chlorosis and then reddening of the crowns. Uh, this is a shot uh, that Brooks Horn from SRD took for us uh, from the air uh, of one of our treatment areas. And you can see we've got, we've got pretty good um, expression of what might be considered green attack, kind of early red attack. Uh, symptoms. Ann McIntosh and, and uh, some members of our crew went out and sort of did uh, um, fixed area um, sampling to see what we had, and that's what's really shown in this bar graph. So here, this is basal area, you know, site occupancy, a good measure of site occupancy. And so the green bars represent what the basal area was during the pre treatment period uh, in each of these treatments, and then the orange bars represent. And this is healthy basal area. So basically, anything that was chlorotic or reddening was excluded from these numbers. So really, it represents the amount of basal area that was affected by the treatments. Um, and you can see in the control, there was ever so slightly a reduction in healthy basal area after the treatments were applied. And this was because the harvesting around the area actually changed the wind, the wind field, the wind environment. And so we lost a few trees, actually, too a little bit of wind throw. But you can see that the treatments that we're trying to achieve, a 50% kill and a 100% kill, we undershot them just a little bit. Uh, 43 and 80% of the basal area affected respectively. But the other part of this is, this is kind of the initial signature one year out. And what we've seen since this time is these treatments have continued to develop in advance. Um, so that's, the effect of the treatment on healthy basal area, but the needles were retained, just as we would expect in the case of uh, a Mount Fine Beetle Red Attack. So the same kind of thing here, this is canopy cover from uh, hemispherical photography, and you can see there's been no reduction in the leaf area in the crown one year after the treatments. Since that time, the needles have slowly started to fall on some trees, but what that means is the results of our studies, the research that was conducted here, really reflects the conditions you see up here. In other words, the results of our work, the hydrology work and the understory work, really reflect this red attack, or green attack, red attack phase. 
does not reflect what we might see after a great attack. Hence the very long the blah 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 kind of title. Uh, effects of variable intensity, mountain pine beetle attack, red and green attack. And so I want you to keep that in mind as you're listening to Pablo and Anne talk about their results. <laughs>